Hello to everybody all the way back there. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to very quickly uh, clear up something that my colleague Michal Levram said earlier. Uh, she said that there were all these interesting conversations happening in the green room. I've just come from the green room. Not one interesting conversation happening back there. It's all happening right here on the main stage. Um, can I have a very quick show of hands to, to know uh, who in the audience feels like they're very familiar with the pivotal software story? Great, okay, so I'd, I'd say about 30%, which was a little bit more than I expected, but still good, a good opener for you, Paul. Paul is an executive for uh, many years at Microsoft, as well as at Intel. He's been with Pivotal and before that VMware for how many years now? Oh, I was, uh, I was at VMware four years, been at Pivotal a year and a half now. <laughs> Give us the, the, the very quick overview of what Pivotal is, since it's, it's obviously not a household name, but it's a very big company. The easiest way to explain it is, is there are three forces at work in enterprise IT today. Frustration, fear, and hope. <laughs> and uh, we're a new company that was put together 18 months ago to speak to the hope part of that. Uh, in that uh, if you look at enterprises today, uh, a lot of them are afraid that they're going to get disrupted uh, by new entrants coming into their businesses using software using big data, using mobility, using cloud, and, and redefining their various areas. And what we're seeing now is, is that actually a small but growing subset of enterprises are actually realizing that they can get past fear and look at hope. And that uh, if they look at themselves and their businesses in the right way and reconceptualize it, uh, they can actually get ahead of this and actually start to compete in interesting new ways. But to do that, they're going to have to rediscover software uh, because software is powering all of this. Uh, so we put together a company uh, that has two dimensions to it. One is, is a more traditional software company in that uh, we have 500 engineers who are working with software technology to produce a new software foundation incorporating a lot of open source. And excuse me, when you say we put together, you mean VMware, you mean EMC? Both? Sorry, sorry, we took assets and we spun them out of EMC and VMware and we took it in an investment from General Electric. Uh, and I'll come back to why we spun them out. But uh, so we have one half of our company that is writing foundational platform software uh, to try and allow you to develop these new kinds of applications in using cloud-based techniques and approaches. The other half of our company is 500 engineers who do custom application development for companies, which is rather unusual for an enterprise company because we realize that it's not just been a revolution in the cloud in terms of what the big consumer internet guys have done in, in developing things that are fundamentally post-paper, but there's also very important lessons about how they've done it, the culture of development uh, and rapid iteration and, uh, and their ability to go around this cycle of developing applications, instrumenting the hell out of those applications, capturing all that information, analyzing it, then driving it immediately back into those experiences and continuously improving them. And that requires a different culture, a different approach to software development. And so, excuse me, if I understand you correctly, the, the, the software part of the company is, has this software that customers can use to write applications that are unique to the cloud. The other part of the company is doing that Exactly. On the assumption that that customer doesn't want to do it themselves. Well, it's not just that they don't want to do it themselves. Increasingly, uh, businesses are realizing that they need to rediscover software development, and software development has moved on from where they remember it 20 years ago. <laughs> and uh, they're almost in a panic saying, where are we going to learn how to do software development? Uh, I had a very large company in the uh, agricultural space come to us and say, we've realized that using all our expertise, if we can get much more and more finer grain data out of the fields, and then we can drive that information back actually into the machinery as they're going through the fields and doing the planting, without using any more water, any more land, any more fertilizer, we can raise crop yields 10%. And they said, you computer guys turn up your noses at 10%, but when it's 10% of the world's food supply, it's a big deal. Yep. But they said, we don't have anything in our IT arsenal that will let us do that. We've got a bunch of guys who know how to make SAP R3 run. <laughs> uh, they don't know how to build this thing. Uh, and they said, we need a relationship with somebody who can not only give us the right underpinnings, but help us develop a new culture of software development 
uh, to develop those kind of experiences. And uh, I just want to go back because I said uh, we spun assets out of uh, EMC and VMware and took in several acquisitions. That was driven partly by a philosophy that when you're facing a new opportunity and that opportunity is significant enough, then it's very hard for a single organization to play offense and defense at the same time. So we needed to create an organization that could play offense and structure the incentives uh, of the people playing offense to go play offense to the best of their ability. So Pivotal employees don't have stock in EMC or VMware, they have stock in, P in Pivotal. And uh, as we were doing that, we came across General Electric, uh, who had come to a similar transition from fear to hope. Uh, <laughs> paraphrasing mightily, uh, several years ago, folks went to Jeffrey Hamilton and said, look, uh, when all the consumers in the world got attached to the internet, that enabled radical change. <laughs> and uh, new competitors came into the marketplace. And, we GE are on the threshold of all the machines in the world getting attached to the internet. If we're not careful, we'll wake up one day and find out that our competition is not Siemens, it's someone else. Mm -hmm. And they went through a period of fear and then they transitioned to a period of hope where they said, okay, let's look at this the other way. Let's reconceptualize. This is what Rene was talking about with the revolving doors. They came back into the door and said, you know, this could be a huge opportunity. So they have created a new capability, a new group, basically, to write all those applications because they realized they needed a new foundation, which we're supplying to them, but they needed a new culture and a new approach to doing software development. So in that regard, they are, a, they are an investor, but in that regard, they're a customer of Pivotal. Correct. They're a partner, customer, investor. And you know, where, we, where we think this is going is, is that there's tremendous business value to be had uh, if you can catch people or things in the act of doing something and affect the outcome. <laughs> okay, what do you mean by catching people in the act of doing things? I have one sense of what that means, but I think you have a different sense. Well, the, uh, <laughs> you can ask yourself, why is a search ad on Google worth, I don't know, 10 or 100 times more than a display ad? <laughs> because Google is, apt to, is, is able to not only bring to the party profile information about who's actually looking at the pages, but they get this real-time signal. Yes. The mere fact that you're there typing stuff into the search box allows you to bring profile information together with real-time information and then affect somebody's behavior or some outcome. Yep. Now, if you look at the use cases that GE thinks that can drive literally tens of billions of dollars of new, new revenue for them. They're all about affecting outcomes, about being able to take deep profile information, history of the world that you've built up, but intersect that with information that's coming in in real time, and, and it's a hard thing to do. This simply can't be done on existing enterprise IT architectures. This requires a fresh approach. You bring that detailed profile information together with real-time event information, and then actually drive processes, drive things to happen, things to pop up in front of the user, or a machine to change its calibration, or whatever. That's where real value is going to come from, and a lot of these businesses that we're seeing coming up now, what's really so revolutionary in driving this value is this notion, it's not just about big data, it's not just about social, it's not just about mobile, it's being able to pull all of that together and actually affect, affect an outcome. I want to um, go back and pause on one thing that you talked about, about the, the financial or the structural aspect of spinning out VMware, which is, uh, I'm sorry, of spinning out Pivotal, which is that EMC had a very happy experience with this sort of thing once already, right? They owned 100% of, of VMware. They kept it independent for the reasons that you stated, and they had a very successful financial outcome as well. I assume, although you're structured differently than VMware, EMC is trying to do something similar here, correct? Uh, I, unashamedly, yes. <laughs> uh -huh. The, uh, you know, this is, uh, a repeat in, in a different form of the VMware play. To say, look, when you see an opportunity that's potentially as big or as important as your existing business, the correct response is not to try and integrate it back into the mothership and try and ask an organization to play offense and defense at the same time. That's very hard for any organization to do. What you need to do is to give it the mandate, the focus, the currency, the culture, because often, these tasks require a different culture. And, and Joe Tucci, to his credit, realized Joe Tucci, the CEO of CEO EMC. Of, of EMC, realized that VMware was a software company. EMC was an East Coast, largely 
at that time, hardware company. It's since changed, but uh, he realized that it would be a mistake to try and blend these cultures together. And what I think is interesting is that EMC uses the, expre the expression federation, and now Pivotal and VMware are in the EMC federation. So EMC has a playbook now, and it's interesting because I don't see other companies following the playbook. It, it, it is an unusual one. There aren't, there aren't a lot of examples of this having been done before, and uh, so we're, we're plowing a new ground here to a certain extent, but uh, you know, it's so important for me that you get the transformation in the culture right, and uh, as I said, we took in a whole group of engineers who are come out of a more traditional system software background, but we also took in these two companies who are arguably the best uh, of the breed in terms of modern agile software development. Which were those? That was Pivotal Labs, from which we took our name, and their Canadian equivalent, Extreme Labs. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they have a radically different culture from what I know, having grown up at Microsoft and VMware. Very, very different approach to how to structure things, how to work with each other, even to the HR practices are quite different. Uh, and we're trying to now imbibe those back into our organization and say, this is what we need to do. And the fascinating thing is, is when companies come and interact with us, it's often that's the part that they're actually most interested in. <laughs> What's an example of, of an HR practice that, that these companies have brought? Well, the, uh, for example, is how you do uh, re reviewing of, of employees, of uh -huh. engineers, because in the, their particular instantiation of the agile methodology, they always work in pairs. <laughs> and uh, pairs are not about having one person look over your shoulder and point out that you missed the semicolon at the end of the line. It's really about mentorship, because they always pair a senior and a junior person together and then they change the pairings frequently during the course of a project. So hmm. that has a great uh, uh, benefit of allowing the, the, the developers to work on all parts of the system. So people tend to see the whole, they tend to anticipate problems right, because they worked on the other side of the fence. They know what the impl implications of doing something are going to be. But by rotating them, you get, everyone gets to work very closely in a very intimate way with everybody else. So you get this incredibly large body of real-time feedback coming in. <laughs> and uh, the, the earliest sign of any problem, I can tell you, is when no, if somebody doesn't want to pair with somebody, if there's one pe people that nobody, one person that nobody wants to pair with, that's like a red flag right there. <laughs> uh, and, to, and that's coming in in real time, information. <laughs> and to be clear, in your experience, it doesn't work this way at VMware or at Microsoft, Well, it example. certainly didn't in, in the days when I were there. I mean, uh, part of the so-called labs approach, the Pivotal Labs approach to software is that software is at its core team sport. <laughs> Uh, and there has to be one rule for everybody. Uh, there's no concept of that somebody is an architect and that gives him the right to go and sit in his room with the door locked and maybe if he deigns to answer email. Uh, everybody works in the same environment, pairings change, and uh, what we find is initially when people go into it, a lot of the big egos are actually quite frightened <laughs> because now they're gonna be exposed, they're gonna have to really work in a very close way with other people but the really good people actually find out very rapidly that their prestige actually gets enhanced because yeah. they are the ones that everybody wants to pair with. Everybody says, hey, I want to come and learn at your feet. I want to work with you. It's so interesting. You're talking about software code writing, but I, I know this applies to other people's industries, in particular, you know, writing of, of words. I'm going to come to, to the audience in a moment. I, I, um, I wanted to make an observation. I've, I've been to VMware and Intel and Microsoft, and I've been to Pivotal's offices in San Francisco. Pivotal looks nothing like those older companies. It's this wide open, vibrant space with lots of people who look like they came in at 11.30 in the morning and yeah, to start actually, their day. And we actually have two offices, one in San Francisco, one in Palo Alto. And the the algorithm is, is if you're under the age of 35 or you have at least two tattoos, then you're allowed to work in San Francisco. <laughs> People like myself who fail the test get sent down to Palo Alto. <laughs> but, but they let you visit San Francisco let me because visit, I yeah. saw you there. Yeah. Um, on the subject of, I, I, I like what you said about playing offense and playing defense. You've, you've used the expressions big data and cloud, but very, very, very few times. Congratulations. <laughs> we're going to have uh, we're going to Satya Nadella from Microsoft. I'm sure we'll talk about cloud and big data. Andy Jassy from Amazon Web Services tomorrow I'll, I'll probably also will. 
why, why, what can you do that I can't go buy from Microsoft and, and Amazon? And why, given their size and success and their client roster, won't they just, you know, proverbially grind you into the ground? Well, the, uh, that's always a possibility <laughs> and one that, you know, we tend to think about. But as much as I fear those folks, I fear the company I don't know even more. Uh, because history teaches us when you have a transition like this, it's a transition not just about technology, but about approach and culture and business model. <laughs> it's very hard for an existing player to get all three of those things right. <laughs> uh, inevitably, either your technology or your business model or your culture or some combination of them you, makes it very difficult for you to morph yep. and actually be there uh, in the way that customers want to see it. And uh, you know, history teaches us that you know, we, we are in a massive generational shift because the canonical, the canonical use cases are changing. You know, our industry started with the mainframe. The canonical use case was basically automation of financial accounting. Then we went to client server and the first generation of the web and the canonical use cases were fundamentally about automating paper-based processes of one form or another. That's why Microsoft, I spent 10 years of my life trying to automate the life of a white collar worker, circa 1980. That's why you know, laptops have files and folders and mm -hmm. inboxes and outboxes and desktops and the rest of it. Very successful journey. Those mm -hmm. applications are not going away. But the use cases are now changing to fundamentally post paper use cases. And not just traditional big data cases. Those are kind of just the early cases. This, what they're changing to uh, these applications that I said are about being able to intersect both real-time and deep profile information to catch things or people as their events are unfolding and affect the events. Those applications simply can't be done on existing structures. They require a new foundation. Question. I need to go like this. Okay, I have a, oh yes, there's a question right here. Your mic is on its way to you. Please tell us who you are. Hi, Paul. Matt McElwain with Madrona Venture Group in Seattle. Yeah. Um, can you say a little bit more about this era of really dataware rather than software that we've talked about before? Specifically, your examples were about agriculture data. They were about General Electric and the sensor data they can capture. So what, what is the gap that's missing? It's not software, but it's data-infused software. And how do you see that missing gap? Well, it, it's both data and software. Uh, you can't, these things are inextricably linked <laughs> uh, because you need, you need the data to work on, but you've got to process the data in both a deep and fast enough a way to actually synthesize something of use out of it. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite examples of an industry that has this problem in spades, and unless they fix it, it's going to be really, really a, a big issue for them, is the telco industry. You take a modern telco, a modern mobile phone company, they know everything about you in terms of your, the buying experience of the phone, your bills, how many times you've been into their shops, but the moment you pick up your phone and make a call, you just become traffic at that point. They have no idea who you are because they're two completely separate worlds. There's a world of customer care, and there's the network world. The customer care world understands people, the network world understands traffic. They have to bring those together in a fundamentally, uh, a, a fundamental way, uh, otherwise they're gonna be in big trouble, if only because for the first time ever, having sold uh, a mobile phone to everybody who can fog a mirror, uh, in the world. I'm told there are now more mobile phones than toothbrushes, uh, <laughs> which says something about our culture. But the, the, uh, they have to worry about customer satisfaction. And a mo mobile phone company can't actually even begin to answer the most elementary hypotheses about what really is driving customer satisfaction in terms of the experience of their core product, which is their network. Uh, because they can tell you, on average, we drop 0.1% of the calls or whatever it is. They just can't tell you whose calls they dropped. And that's a really hard problem because you take a big mobile phone company, if you're gonna get all that data off the backbone of their network, you're looking at ingesting literally a million events a second. <laughs> uh, you have to intersect all of those events with all the profile information of potentially millions of customers <laughs> and put those two things together and say, oh, 
my goodness, this base station is overloaded. Let's kick off the person who's paying us the least amount of money, not the person who's paying us the mm. most amount of money. And that decision has to be made in a fraction of a second. Now, that's an extreme example, but you're going to see that pattern reoccur all over the place. <laughs> Uh, even in the financial services industry, as we talk about things like real-time risk, you've built up deep profile information, you're getting all these signals coming in from the market, you want to make, be, able, be able to make decisions in real time, not just to be able to capture an arbitrage opportunity, but in future in light of your risk profile. Uh, and all of these kinds of applications require a usage or that, that allows you to ingest data incredibly rapidly, reason over it, and intersect it with very deep profile information. And we think that category of applications can be found in almost every industry in the world. And they will be the equivalent of the paper-based, the automation of the paper-based world that drove you know, the second, gener second big generation of client server, of computing, the client server area. Paul, I feel like you've uh, given us a view of, of what's coming next in our industry. And I, I thank you very much for being here. Great, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs>